16 of the 38 parables of Jesus talk about finances. One out of every 10 of the Old Testament scriptures talks about this subject. There's over 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, but over 2,000 verses over the subject of finances and being able to talk about possessions and material things. Now, it's not a sin to have wealth, but when wealth has you, that's when it can lead to sin. Now, before every legalistic and religious person talks about saying, oh, it's not about money, you gotta preach the gospel, preach the gospel, because we get that all the time. I've run countless Facebook ads about my kingdom group, and I've had so many religious people in the comments. Let me just share this, this ain't for you. And first off, the gospel is not centered around money. So no way am I saying that money is the gospel. I talk a lot about the gospel and what it truly is, okay? This is not the center of the gospel. But there's something that the Bible teaches us when it comes to finances. Today, I'll be talking a little bit more like tithe, offering. Now, again, it's not a sin to have money. It's when money has you, okay? <laughs> it's when money has you. And we'll see this. I'll actually have a couple notes here, but I really want to break this down. The gospel isn't about wealth. The gospel isn't about having money but it is a tool. It is a tool that expands and advances the kingdom of God. It is a resource. God is the source. So this is up to you and not everyone's going to be a millionaire. Okay. So I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it type of deal. There are stewardship principles to be able to obtain wealth. The book of Proverbs, it talks about how wisdom allows us to obtain wealth and it is through biblical wisdom. So many questions that people have about this. I'm going to make this teaching short. If you want me to do an expansive uh, talk about this, let me know below. But I really want to dive deep because this is just a couple people that continue to say, oh, preach the gospel, stop focusing on money. It's not, it's not money, okay? It's not the money. The issue is the heart. The issue is greed. Matthew it tells us this. I think it's Matthew chapter 6, verse uh, 21. It says, wherever your treasures are, there where your heart will be also. This is not the center of the gospel. It is not money. A lot of people come out like that. And it's like, if you don't want any type of resources, you're not called to do business, build uh, different businesses. If you're not called for that, that's fine. We're not asking you to. Biblical prosperity. Okay. I don't believe in the prosperity gospel because in nowhere in the Bible, you're going to see the words prosperity gospel. I do believe in biblical prosperity. I believe in prosperity and I do believe in the gospel. So there is a difference, but props prosperity gospel before people start uh, slapping us on that. That's not what we're talking here. I'm not telling you to rub your Bible three times, make three wishes, and God will give you whatever you want. Not everyone's going to be called to be a millionaire as Christians. And that is okay. Real prosperity. This is all it is. It's God supplying all my needs, not my wants. God supplies all my needs and the little extra is my way to be able to bless others that's prosperity that is biblical prosperity now these people that are great stewards that know how to build assets cash flowing businesses machines that are able to fund ministry that are able to expand the kingdom you get private investors that are able to help churches grow and build the investors is good at building business in their industry software SaaS. Whatever it is, whatever that, that those businesses are that are clocking in million dollars a month, right? Paying a ton of employees, running a big, big overhead, but they're cash flowing or maybe profiting 500K a month. Now, what do they, they do with that? They're able to fund a lifestyle, but also give back to God. When you learn about these uh, different principles, you're going to start to see it differently. A lot of people, before anybody even goes in, and I'm going to dig deep on this, listen to this whole teaching before you start making comments. Now, if you don't, think that pursuing money is is your deal or then don't honestly don't hate on others that they're the ones that are building it at the end of the day it's a heart just because somebody's got a nicer car than you maybe a little bigger of a house than you again it depends on the heart this is what it says in first timothy i'm just going to read it again because a lot of people like to misconstrue it um, or misinterpret it first timothy 6 10 for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from their faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Skip over to verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So we don't put our trust in 
tools. We don't put our trust in finances. We put our trust in God. Verse 18, let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, we may struggle. We may face tribulation, trials. We're called to be in Romans 12, a living sacrifice, and we got to make some sacrifices. But having more wealth doesn't make somebody evil. Just like you can, you can have people that don't have a lot of money, they could be evil too. So it's not the amount of money that someone has in their bank account that makes them evil. People that don't have a lot of money in their bank account, we see that all the time. They're evil too. It's just how it is, okay? Spiritual warfare is real. Now you're gonna get some people before I get into this teaching that are gonna talk about, well, the the, the rich young ruler or it's easier from, for a camel to go through a needle's eye than a rich man to enter into heaven. Did y'all know if you actually read the contents behind this, it's not talking about the rich person, right? Well, the rich, well, brother, you got all this money. Give it all away. <laughs> Be just like Jesus said to the rich young ruler. It doesn't have to do with them being just rich. It has nothing to do with, with just that. It has everything to do with one thing and maybe a few other things, but mainly it's greed. It's greed. So people will use those verses to try to come at you and people that have wealth or a lot of money, a lot of assets, and be like, just give it all away, just like Jesus. And they like to twist scriptures just to get it their way. And these people, they're hurt people. These people, they honestly have no biblical wisdom or discernment around these things. And when I lay these simple things down, because we could talk about this for hours, I've done extensive studies on this subject. I pray and I promise you will be renewed in the mind. Amen. So, Let's talk about this. Um, again, these are all good stuff. Money is a tool. It helps expand the kingdom. It is a resource. It is not the source. Uh, and then I want to just share this. People that were rich in the Bible. People that were rich in the Bible. Abraham. In Genesis 13, it says Abraham was rich. And a lot of people are like, well, he's going to be rich spiritually. Let me overcome that. Keep reading the verse. Abraham was rich in livestock, in gold, and in silver. And if you continue to read out all through Genesis, he was a wealthy person. He had armies, okay? He had armies of people. If he was able to capture the people that got his, uh, that got Lot, you can only imagine how he was able to just conquer lands. And in fact, we're going to actually read how in Genesis, the first person that gave a tithe um, and who it was given to was the high priest. The first person that gave a tithe was, was who? Uh, uh, Abraham. And I'm, I'm saying tithe because this is the first, this is the law first mentioned. Uh, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I really want to just pop this up, okay? Plant the seeds with you guys. Job, Job was wealthy. Solomon, Solomon was wealthy. In fact, Solomon also had businesses. I did a whole study on the type of businesses. He he was actually in the trading business, which is kind of crazy with the, the exporting uh, and importing business. Wow. And that's that'll, that'll be for another talk. That'll be for another talk. And then uh, you can look at in New Testament, Joseph Aramithe. He's the one that allowed, instead of his tomb, he gave it to Jesus. And you can see everything that he did to bless Jesus's tomb. He was actually a secret follower of Jesus, okay, is what the scriptures uh, really revealed. And on top of that, um, this dude was like, you know, he, he was another one of the, the leaders. So let's talk about these couple of things because I have so much that I want to share about this, but I'm, I'm going to make this very, very simple and short. If you guys want to learn more, I will link some stuff, probably my email list, because I talk a lot about this on my email list. Uh, so I'll put that below. But let's talk about the tithe. So the tithe is a tenth part. That's all it means, a tenth part. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10, people use this verse, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So the Old Testament, the Israelites were ordered to give one tenth of all their income. Can I just tell y'all? It's all God's. He's just asking for what is actually his. So everything you own, if you're a believer, a follower of Christ, and you believe in Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he owns everything you have. <laughs> the bank account, the car, everything. You're just a manager of it. Okay. He is the owner. You're just a manager. So it all belongs to God. The Lord was just simply asking to give back a portion of, of what is his, and that's was what the tithe was. Now, here's a bar. Tithing is your relationship with God. Tithing is your relationship with God. So the first time that tithe was mentioned 
in Genesis 14, 18 to 20. Uh, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed them and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who had, who had delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. So this is the law of first mention. Whenever I, I read the Bible, any of these principles, one of the first things I do, three things to be able to really study uh, the Bible when it comes to understanding topics. The law of first mention, which we just saw. This was the first time Tath was, was mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 14. The law of first mention, the law of context. What is the context around that scripture? Number three is the law of definition. So I gave you all the context. I gave you all the definition and I gave you all the law of first mention. This is Genesis 14. You can study more on it. So this is the first time that tithing was mentioned and it was again given uh to it was given to the priest uh Melchizedek and this is just straight from Abraham okay and again tithing is your relationship to God it's a tenth it's a tenth it's all going to make sense now a lot of people use Malachi 3 and I've heard so many different I'll say it like Pharisee type of teachings around Malachi 3 like oh that's not what it says here's the thing in the Old Testament there were Israelites that were robbing God by selfishly holding on to God's money. Remember, it's already God's. It's his anyways. But in Malachi 3, 8, will a, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say what we have robbed you in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this says the Lord of hosts. If not, or if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out of for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fa fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. You'll see a lot of people using this verse and honestly, they use it in the right context when it comes to tithing. Now, a lot of people believe that tithing is a Old Testament uh, teaching because they're like, well, there's nothing in the New Testament that says that you must tithe. You know, this is always the argument. Now, but we do see offering. The difference between the tithe, again, tithe is a tenth. And then there's offering, which is what we believe is anything above 10. Okay, anything above 10. Let me answer those questions and I'll probably just answer it now in this transition. The question is, am I supposed to give a tithe to my ministry? And what do you think about that, RC? Do you always give a tenth? We see Old Testament practice. And honestly, we never see it saying, do not do this in the New Testament. Well, we're reading a lot of the New Testament stuff. It always talks about the heart check. It talks about being a good steward with money. Again, these are all kingdom principles when it comes to uh, just, it could be towards finances. It could be stewardship just in general. So you'll see all this. And again, tithe, 10th, offering is, it could be anything above the 10th. Now, the reason why I am very particular with a lot of stuff that I say, and I really pray that the Holy Spirit, Father, I just pray that you would just continue to enlighten us as we study this. It's because there's so many ways that people would put, uh, and so many questions to, to because what the enemy does is God has a promise and the enemy perverts it, okay? Let me just share one thing, or actually a couple things, but the main thing is like, should I give a 10% to my local ministry? Can I just tell you? If, and the reason why you do, if you're being poured into and you believe in the leadership, the pastors, the vision, if you believe in the mission that they're doing in, in local ministry, you should give a minimum of 10. Am I gonna, or should I, like for example, I as a leader, should I be like, oh, well, you, if you don't give 10, you know, you're not, whatever, you're you're not getting this position. If you don't give 10, you don't belong to this church. If you don't give 10, you're going straight to the bottom of hell. You know, like, no, we don't do that. We don't do that. Red flags, okay? This is a heart check. We're all being worked on. And tithing is a relationship between you and God. What the ministry or the churches do with it is between them and God. Y'all feel me? So tithing is a relationship between me and God. If I believe in the mission and the vision of what they're doing, my local ministry is doing, I'm going to sow into it. I'm going to sow in. That's the 10. That's the tithe. Okay. A 10. You should be doing that in your local storehouse, which is your local ministry. The storehouse is your local ministry. 
the offering is if you you want to give a little bit more. Okay, that will be your offering. So that's why they call it tithes and offering. Again, we don't make it mandatory. Like there's churches that make it mandatory. They'll have you sign that you promise to give a 10 because you're a member. We personally don't do that because I believe that's a form of witchcraft. That's a form of control. There is what I could see an accountability towards it. But again, back away, pray to the Lord and see if this is really a healthy ministry. I talk a lot about healthy discipleship, tons of teachings on that. Again, this is where when people talk about money, it gets funny in the church. Okay. Now the offering is above. When I think about offering, I'm like, if do you have any online ministers that you sow into or, or other churches that have a similar mission based on what you've dealt with? Divorces, prison, um, trafficking. We hear a lot about that. So things that single moms that might resonate with you and their missions are looking to expand out there. So the offering is like not just giving to your local church, but giving to other places. That's why places will ask for offerings and you might not be part of that local church. I believe a 10th is mandatory. Anything above that, as far as like offering, that is that extra. Now it says this in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one gives as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And that's the thing. Tithing is relationship with God. The offering, it's like being being a cheerful giver. Be a cheerful giver. Like So don't give grudgingly. Give, give out of joy, with a joyful heart. Proverbs 28, 27. Whoever gives to the poor will lack nothing, but those who's, who closes their eyes to poverty will be cursed. I really pray and hope that I gave at least some, some clarity. Now, again, if you believe in the leadership and that's your local church and you're planted in there, you should sow because this is to help give provision to both the leaders and the mission of whatever the vision is. We're all coming together as a body of Christ. There will be people that pervert this and say, oh my gosh, they're just taking your money, yada, yada, yada. These guys are scammers. I've seen that side. And then I've seen the people that are like, stop talking about money. Stop trying to build wealth. Stop trying to build businesses. You know, da, 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 da. I'm like, well, then stop trying to stop trying to make, I tell them stop trying to make money because the very phone that you're commenting this on, there's bills that have been paid. There's money to use this resource, just like your local ministry. There's resources for the lights, the AC, so much more that I'm sure the church does that does more good for the community and the world. Just some things to think about. I know I'm going a little bit over. I wanted to do a very short teaching, but there's just so much that I go through my thoughts because a lot of people have perverted this thinking. Business, 10% of profits, go straight. Every business I do, go straight, build it out. And I tell people, you know, the way that I run ministry and we run our ministry is going to be different than the other ministry. But God has ordained these people to be able to sow and make sure it's good soil. Sow onto good soil and good ground. That's why I said, if you believe in the leadership and that ministry, why not? Why not fund that mission? Okay. I'm not talking about people that need to beg. Uh, and that's not how it should be. It should come from a place of like, hey, if you guys are led and the Holy Spirit touches you to give, let it be so. That's how our ministry does it. Hey, if you're led to give, you know, we don't push on it. Because I understand that God is working on everybody when it comes to the relationship with tithing. Because remember, Matthew 6, um, Matthew six twenty one, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So this is a heart check above all. Again, greediness, it's a heart check. It's not money that is evil, it's the love of it. That is all, that is the root of all kinds of evils. Okay, the root, deep teaching there. Three principles I want you guys to learn, and then I'm going to talk to you guys uh, about these five things that produce kingdom wealth. Three principles. Wisdom, stewardship, and gifting. Wisdom, stewardship, gifting. I don't have time to go through all this. If you guys want to learn more, let me know. I'll create more videos on this. And I'll also, on my my newsletter, I talk a lot about uh, kingdom, kingdom wealth and kingdom business. If you guys want to learn and all these different kingdom principles, I'll link that below. Okay. Deuteronomy 8.18, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Five things that produce kingdom wealth. Five things that produce kingdom wealth. Inheritance, calling, gifting, giving, skilled work. And I've been writing a lot about this over the past few months. Again, all these things will be on my newsletters. I'm creating blogs around this as well. 
videos around this. Let me know in the comments below if any of this resonated with you. What questions do you have so I can answer those in the coming videos? I'll probably make this a series. And then also, did any of these stick to you? Five things that produce kingdom wealth. Inheritance, calling, gifting, giving, skilled. If you want to learn more, I'll probably be dropping a lot of these. I have a fruitful Friday email list. It'll be in the link below. You guys can opt into that. But if you've made it this far, let me know if you've made it this far and just type in, in the uh, comments below, wealth, wealth. Again, wealth is not a sin, but the moment that wealth has you, it may lead to it. Type in wealth below if you guys got this far. Thank you so much for listening. I pray that you do this with an open heart. I'll see y'all in the next video. God bless you. Bye-bye.